Hi everyone, welcome to episode 20 of Let's Talk ID. Today we have a really special episode. I thought I'd do something a bit different. I thought I'd get together a group of people from different backgrounds, all located around design. We have Sarah and Neil, who work at Clandestine Design Group, Neil as the owner of the consultancy. We have Angus, who works at TopCon, which is an in-house design team, um, and he's the design manager there. And we have Raf, who is Rafael Gomez, who is my head, my head lecturer back when I went to QT, and he runs the industrial design course there. All different people from different design backgrounds, all together to talk about the common interest and common passion for design. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you if you enjoy it, please subscribe as I'm looking to grow the podcast. And the best way you can help grow it is by subscribing and sharing with your friends. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming on today. It's really great to get people from multiple disciplines in all different sections of industrial design together to talk about design and, yeah, see where the conversation takes us. No problem. Looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us on. Thanks, Roman. So, yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, we have all these different designers from different spaces. We have Raf from, Go from um, teaching. He's a head lecturer at QT. We have Angus. I'm just following order on my screen. <laughs> we have in Angus from an in-house team at TopCon um, representing in-house design. We have Neil and Sarah from Clandestine Design Group, which is a consultancy located in Brisbane. So everyone represents a different type of design, um, all centered around industrial design. Mm. Yeah. So just to start off, the first question we have, we're going to go with Sarah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Our first question we have is, should we accept to see more designers in political positions in the coming years? This is an intense question for the first one. Yes. Yes. Because design is critical to how we shape our society and applying design thinking to the processes and, well, and the humans that are, that we govern. I think that's absolutely. So I would like to see more of that. In mm. coming years. Yeah. Do you think there's a push in parliament for that kind of move? Uh... I think it needs to be a push from the design industry mm. and um, and I feel like it's it's coming like we have the design council and they are doing gr some great work um, but yeah people don't really like as an industrial design people don't really know what we're doing mm. um, and I think we we just need to start first of all with changing that um, but yeah political definitely that's how you get shit done <laughs> yeah anyone else like to talk about that yeah, um, I'll add my two cents, uh, Roman. Um, I think you've seen it in other countries that have done this mm -hmm. successfully. Um, in some of the Nordic countries, um, have have achieved a, a, a kind of bottom up and a top down approach to design and and the way that they think about design. Um, you know, New Zealand has a very good connection um, um, uh, in in that area as well. I, I don't think there's anyone specifically positioned at a, at a political level officially but but they they have a very good connection the uk design council do have a very good um and and even you see it in places like singapore as well um where they have uh people in with a design background in in and uh, and again a portfolio that kind of looks after that aspect of innovation and development you know mm -hmm. um and and there's a lot to 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 say about that and and there's some re there's been some really good outcomes as a result of that but of course there's there's challenges that come out of that yeah. approach as well yeah. um but i agree with sarah it, it's it's important um it's really important for a whole host of reasons mm. yeah yeah i suppose it comes down to kind of the the empathetical approach of designers and how quite often having that empathetical approach can be important in that role um, also being able to, you know, be invested in solving a problem. I suppose that that is also a key part of design and like that is important in, in, in parliament and definitely something that having that investment in making, you know, important changes in the world is definitely very important. So. Yeah, I, I would also add, um, and and Neil and, and Angus, if you want to chime in here as well, because you guys know it from a from and, and Sarah from a from a industry perspective as well, is the the kind of you know design um, industrial design has and design as a whole. Um, we see so many of the designers now practicing um, more around 
the implications for you know like at a strategic level and a, and a, and a kind of um, stuff that that is not about product designers and a product individual device but the way that you know um, we engage with all sorts of you know complex problems that we're faced with um, sustainability and all these other things that I know you and I talked about in, in our previous podcast mm. um, and I think that's where it's important um, to engage kind of those concepts of innovation, um, of thinking differently than the status quo um, um, that we bring as designers, you know, to that space. And it's, yeah, it's important to, I think, at, at all levels of government. Actually, a um, uh, guy that uh, used to work with us at Infinity, he now, I believe, works in the Logan Council um, as, as uh, in the innovation department, I think. So it's kind of doing that sort of thing, I guess, at a grassroots mm -hmm. level. And um, I mean, you only have to drive around the suburbs of Brisbane to know that, um, you know, the, the, the building code <laughs> needs, <laughs> needs some designers in there uh, because there's a, it's an atrocious kind of uh, landscape out there these days um, compared to some other countries like uh, you mentioned, New Zealand, who, t who tend to uh, approach it very differently. So I think, yeah. At all levels of government, uh, a design influence can only be a good thing. Mm. Yeah, I think if you don't have a culture that's you know has some sort of um, predetermined bias towards design or, or has utilised it to advantage and understands its value from a very ancient time, then we need to have an intervention at every level. Of <laughs> yes, um, an intervention is the right word. And yeah. and you know it's and and it can come across in different ways. I noticed years ago I saw a presentation on the new Estonian government and they, I can't remember, I don't think it was a chief design officer, I think it was a chief technology officer that they had appointed and we were making, it was making radical change around user experience through technology initiatives and design initiatives. And I guess in Queensland, we're saying we've got the chief entrepreneur sitting in a Queensland role and there's obviously a similar role in, in South Australia, but you know, allowing design and embracing design, both the previous, all the chief entrepreneurs have all embraced design and design thinking and design strategy work. And we're starting to see that have some manifestation and, and magnification in the Queensland business sector. But yeah, lots to do. And as Raf says, there's some great examples around the world that we can reference and lean to and um, build on. Hmm. Yeah, great. Well, moving on, we have, next we have Neil. Uh, will advance advancements in CAD mean that we no longer need traditional sketching skills in the coming years? <laughs> uh, No, we still need traditional sketching skills. Um, you know, until we've got you know the neuro Neuralink chips embedded, and I can literally beam my thoughts to Sarah or Angus at the time, and probably the quickest way that we're communicating concepts and ideas in the studio context is is a thumbnail sketch. Um, you know, and, and articulating a schematic or a mechanism um, within seconds. Uh, you know, literally that you know that that drawing saves. Um, you know, a thousand words, I guess, in terms of process. Yeah. Sometimes I, I feel like I've asked a question that I know the answer to, but it's sometimes nice to get nice to get people to who are in the position of employment to give that give that advice to people that it is still really an important skill. So. Yeah, for sure. What do you what's the rest of the crazy thing? Oh, it's vital skill. You can't you can't get by without it really. I mean, um and I think you you kind of hit the nail on the head, Neil. It's less about um, at least, at least in in my environment here, we we're not doing a lot of really elaborate presentations. Um, you know, internally, we're doing kind of enough enough of a concept presentation, let's say, to to um, communicate what what's needed. And we've got over the over time developed a certain style that we've stuck with. But more so, it's it's in the studio when we're all. Uh, throwing around ideas and, you know, even up on the whiteboard, just being able to really um, sketch something really quickly to explain what you mean. So, yeah, you don't have to say a thousand words or, I mean, I find it really hard to kind of get it out and I just always default to, to drawing it and go, this is what I mean. And and I think that skill, um, yeah, I, don't, I can't see that ever being defunct. Mm. Uh, and even when I was, you know, consulting, 
that sort of um, sketching in a meeting while you're talking to a client and, and uh, you know, they're talking and you go, oh, I kind of like this. And that, that type of thing really, um, it helps to build their confidence in you that, you know, they can see that you understand what they're talking about. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty essential skill for any designer, I think. Yeah. Well, um, maybe just moving on from there, we'll go to okay. Angus. Hang on. I think Sarah wants to go. 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 So. Yes. I was just going Actually, to say, I was just going to say, mate. There's often when I'm sketching out with the team here, I'm talking about Angus is like the, the interaction. Mm. Um, because probably I'm a poor communicator or I mumble or something. What I find interesting is that the designers interpreted my sketch in actually a 180 degree perspective to what I wanted, and after a whole bunch of, uh, you know, I guess working out why we're not why we're not getting each other, it's like oh, actually the way you're seeing it is actually a better idea than what I had in my head. So mm -hmm. there's still a medium there that's loose mm -hmm. and agile, and sure it's it's complemented by verbal. Um, articulation but it's interesting just letting the other person interpret what you're sketching and seeing what their reaction to it. I think that's sometimes where the magic is mm. uh, and also yeah. the creativity that comes from sketching like it's just so much quicker and you just have ideas and you just put them down all the time and when you're in CAD I find that people get really narrow-minded and mm. it's all about like how do I do this rather than what am I trying to achieve mm. So going into, we always try to do sketching first before we do CAD, so you can really explore. Because when you when you're in CAD, you just you're trying to um, reach for that perfect model, and mm -hmm. it's not the mm -hmm. same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Roman, just to add to that, because I was going to mention Sarah what you mentioned, which is the the what what Neil and Angus mentioned is is critically important, um, and and I completely agree with what they said. The extension to that was that I think we've all experienced this as designers is you're drawing something, what you think you're drawing in, the, in in your head. And then all of a sudden you do a different line and you go, oh, I didn't like, so the act of drawing changes your thought process as you're doing. It. And the other bit, which is really important is in teaching future designers is mm -hmm. I think getting them to draw calibrates their brain differently. Right. And, 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 and so it's not not even let's forget about the, the the skill of drawing let's just just the actual sitting down with a pen and paper gets you thinking about what you do as a designer differently mm. and and reconnects your brain there's a lot of studies to suggest that mm. and that's not to say that we shouldn't have other things because there's other things obviously like model making right that could disappear in terms of like what we need to learn in industry but the learning of design and doing some models early on puts your brain, you know, connects your brain in a different way than, than other things. Um, so all of these have really important roles to play in like learning about what you are as a designer and who you are as a designer mm. um, as well. Yeah, I suppose there's a, there's a bit of a trap in um, designers starting out is that people can easily jump to CAD and they can kind of forget about the fundamental skills of industrial design, like model making, sketching. And maybe there isn't enough emphasis on the fact that in the industry, it is really important. And we should be, you know, really promoting the fact that everyone should be able to sketch to a good level, you know, to be, to be successful in industry. Yeah. And I guess, you know, you look at my team here and there's, there's not all of us are at visual communication level 110, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's a few of us that are VizCon pros and, um, and match it with the best of us but mm. the rest of us are just good enough communication skills that when they're in a client meeting like angus says and they're on the whiteboard that the client can uh, can you know most of our clients are not designer backgrounds so they if you don't sketch well they'll invert the image they'll change the perspective they'll flip it upside down and then they'll be lost but if you can engage them with a decent in perspective um and in proportion uh mechanically accurate um sketch and 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 help drive through an outcome in a meeting. It's a very useful tool. Um, and uh, yeah, so you don't have to have uh, everyone at Leon Fitzpatrick levels of skill. You just you just need some decent fundamentals taught and honed, I guess. Mm. Mm. It's a clear idea of communication rather than the visual impact. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, moving on from there. Uh, Neil, should graduate designers start out in-house consultancy or manufacturing role? That's me first. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
I don't mind either. Like, um, as long as they're getting industry relevant experience, hmm. um, I don't mind where they start. Um, to be honest, because you know, um, some of the best designers I've worked with or trained or or had in teams have had various starting points. We've had guys that have gone and worked in Acacia Ridge running HVAC systems and drafting HVAC systems for industrial, you know, air conditioning manufacturers. Um, I guess it's up to the individual to pull out of that experience all the professional skills that they need mm. and move on to the next on to the next role. And I think about um, those designers maturing and, and you know, a world-class um, detailers as a result of having to work in, in that industry and they were incredible pro sheet metal guys. And then as, as a design manager, bringing them into my team, I'm like, right, you've got such a good platform man, to start teaching you, um, you know, injection molding fundamentals or blow molding fundamentals. But on top of that professional practice around sheet metal for air conditioners, mm-hmm. they had 90% of the professional skills covered. And I was just teaching them at a time, 10% on top, 10% on top, 10% on top. So the burden to me as an employer or a design manager in that case, on that graduate designer that had spent two years at a HVAC company, was very little, very low. So I guess in short for me, it doesn't matter where you start as long as you start with industry practice somewhere. Mm. I mean, I've seen, uh, I've, I've also worked with designers who kind of didn't start in-house. I mean, I did. My first job was, yeah, designing acrylic fabricated and vacuum formed bits and pieces and um, yeah, point of sale displays, that sort of thing. And um, I think what that taught me though was, was to be able to think in my feet and problem solve uh, really quickly because working in that environment as a, as a graduate, there are always going to be disasters that happen. And the, in a manufacturing environment, those disasters need to be fixed pretty quick. And, and so that, that kind of um, really nuts and bolts approach that you, you tend to get from being out on the factory floor and working with the guys out there. Like we, I remember we had a, a group of uh, prototyping uh, pattern makers and then, you know, then there was a screen printing department back forming and, and, and uh, fabrication section and everyone was kind of in the one big factory space so you could walk from one to the other. But um, spending a lot of time with each of those groups really kind of brought a lot of the stuff that I'd learned at uni you know, it, it brought it right home to me and, and it was a real baptism of fire for, for me. And I felt like I learned a lot from it that I could then apply later on in a consulting environment. I kind of, I, you know, you have those problems that you're going to try and solve and I could see myself standing in that factory um, and felt like I was in a pretty good position to be able to um, problem solve there. I mean, the the flip side of that of course is that you don't do that you go straight into a consulting environment you get to work on a bunch of really different projects and you're learning less about um nuts and bolts manufacturing techniques but you're learning about lots of different industries so you know um i had to catch up on that later on um i had more of a more of a an in-house experience first before I went into consulting and, and actually when I went to consulting, it was a massive shock to the system for me. Um, and then I got, yeah, once I got up to speed, it was great. I loved it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, if I'm employing someone though, I would love them to have that kind of, um, you know, at least a year's experience working in a factory, seeing that they're, you know, taking what they're designing out into the factory floor and seeing how that comes to life. I think that's a really valuable experience. Mm. Um, Roman, I might, I might add, the more, the more, the, the, the pre-question I would, I would say is what does the student or what does the individual want to get to in their career Mm. because that and 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 also like what do they enjoy what's their passion in design um because if you can line those things up then you know like firstly the passion bit if they're passionate about what they do they'll they'll you know they really work hard at achieving a good a good outcome and secondly it's like what do they want to where do they see themselves in the future is you know there's some amazing um amazingly talented 
to designers that that have gone in and just worked in you know manufa- at the manufacturing really liaising closely with the engineers and and becoming a real expert and that's because they love it you know they really enjoy that and then others who have crafted a really good career angus and and, and neil uh, as i've mentioned is going in you know and, and finding their path through different job roles and taking the best and you know out of what they learned initially and then going oh, i really like an in-house design kind of space or i really like the consultancy space because there's lots of projects or whatever the case may be you know um but it's important to i think line it up with like what's their future goal and, and what do they enjoy in design and just also adding to that like everyone's on a different journey and mm. it just means that it, it's just as important to figure out what you don't like so if you do take the opportunity while you're young to kind of jump around a bit and just seeing what 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 you like what you don't like like I've been very lucky because I well I've been um, consultancy all the time but within the consultancy I've been able to explore different avenues like strategic design um, and UX design and like all different things on different projects um, and I think that's really it's it's been really good for my journey because I could really then figure out what what do I love and what um, what do I want to like where do I want to aim my career Mm. um yeah so it doesn't really matter where you start i think it's more where you end up mm. and the journey yeah so i think the other important thing that we see a lot of you know young designers to middleweight designers that have come out of industry is they've they've i think it's important to see see this is a wish list right they're about to stay here but if, if they go in and get an in-house role um in a manufacturer um and they're picking up manufacturing skills like angus did with his um this a signage company, a shop fitting company. Um, probably what you might have been missing, Angus, is design leadership. And we see see design leadership missing um, in a lot of in-house roles because Australian society or Australian industry particularly isn't got design leaders, hence why there's a whole lot of consultants that sit out there. They've got, um, and they tend to use design as um, on a project by project basis. They don't have that skill set in-house. There are a lot of manufacturers with in-house design leaders. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, if there's graduates coming out and listening to this podcast and they've got an option of going with company A that's a sophisticated tier one Australian manufacturer and company B that's similar but with a really strong design leader, mm. and I'd suggest mm. go with a design leader if you can because mm. they'll teach you and mentor you in your, your trade craft of design. At the same time, you're picking up all of those valuable shop floor um, skills and knowledge that Angus was referring to before. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, quite a lot of my time, a lot of service time is actually working for our in-house clients managing and helping being quasi design directors for their in-house design team because the ceos don't understand how to drive a design team they know that know it's important enough to have the resources on board but they don't know how to actually drive the resources so you know a couple of days a month for our, of our time is sitting in those companies um not actively doing but mentoring and managing those design teams for them hmm. yeah I'm, I'm really lucky i'm currently working under a my operation manager is an industrial designer back has industrial designer background and yeah he's really really amazing guy very driven and has worked in the industry for many years and working underneath him even even though i'm not directly working underneath him just having daily weekly conversations with him have been very beneficial and i I see what you mean like having someone at that you know that management level who has that design background can be very important yeah the mentorship thing is huge i Mm. think it's a really good point you know you you need that that guiding light um, to keep you on track and someone that's been there before and, and, and can assist you and, and um, help you along. Yeah. Mm. Maybe just to move on, we'll go to, we've got uh, for next is Angus. Um, we've got what will AI take our jobs or empower our position as designers? <laughs> I think it's not going to take our jobs. Mm. I think um, AI is a, an interesting tool that um, I think may in some cases may diminish someone else's uh, kind of uh, opinion or of design, you know, like, uh, you know, graphic designers really suffered from lots of people being able to use illustrator and then calling themselves graphic designers, you know? And um, I think that the danger with AI could be that I will, you know, 
um, I don't need a designer. I can just, you know, I can just do, just do this using AI. But of course, it's only going to get you so far. It's not going to get you um, all the way. So I think, um, you know, I think it, it's an interesting tool. I think there are some IP um, question marks around it. Um, who actually owns the, the output, I think is a, still something that I know that this company is grappling with at the moment where we've kind of put a bit of a hard stop on that until we work out exactly what the IP uh, implications are. So that's something um, to explore. But I think, look, it's probably a tool that we could, we could use and it's going to get better, I would imagine. Um, but I don't think that it, it's going to replace designers because the skill set of designers is so broad and complex um, that, yeah, I just can't see it happening. Mm. I don't know what anyone else thinks, but I've heard a good <laughs> I've heard a good metaphor for it, and it's just that um, um, the AI is sort of like an intern, so it produces a lot of ideas, but you still need a design manager to pick out what's good and to guide it. Mm -hmm. So I think I really think of it as more of a tool, and it's going to probably take away some of the mundane tasks that we don't really want to do. Um, or for instance, say in CAD, if I can just make the outer shell of something and then I can say like, okay, we'll now make it for injection molding. And it will present me with like maybe 10 different options of how to do that. Hmm. Um, and then you as a designer can, can then use that and then guide through the path, but in a much more efficient way hmm. than what you would normally do. So I think it's incredibly powerful. And, um, but yeah, as uh, Angus was saying, there's going to be some interesting um, copyright um, issues with it. Um, I've seen some good stuff coming out with Adobe. Um, I can't remember the program, but they're, they're actually granting, or they're looking at the licensing deal so that you can, you can sort of purchase it because it's a paid model. Um, so yeah, I want to keep an eye on that because that's mm. really cool. Mm. Yeah, it's a pretty fast moving space mm. at the moment. Um, the other thing, just kind of going off what Neil, you were saying earlier about sketching is that, you know, it could be a good um, ideation tool where, you know, I've, I've seen some, some um, just watch some YouTube clips on, on a hairdryer and, you know, what, depending on what prompt you put in, you might get this crazy looking hairdryer that, that comes back. That's nothing like what you're thinking. Uh, and then the iterations of that, um, you know, I can see it being useful in that way where you sort of, you know, your, your prompts um, end up giving you something that you didn't even think of. Like when you're sketching, you sort of, you know, like you were saying, Raph, one line in a different direction then makes you go, oh, okay. You know, takes you off in a whole other um, train of thought. But, yeah. Yeah, I'm excited by it becoming an aid or a tool. I think I mentioned to you in, in, in my podcast that we've been playing around with BizCon Plus, which is probably the closest active aid design tool we've seen. Um, to your point, Angus, it's still got some pretty uh, sketchy T's and C's on IP. Well, that was yeah. when I looked at it a while ago. It might have changed now. But, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it seeing it becoming an, an aid and it's speeding up my process and my thinking. As you say, having those quick moments of divergent thinking or flashes of inspiration that comes from a random prompt or a loose hand sketch or, or something like that it'll be good um you know it's uh yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not worried or afraid i'm just excited at this point in time yeah i, I think like the long-term thing there's like you know we can discuss ad nauseum interesting conversation to be honest about like the dystopian and the utopian mm. you know ways that this could go um and we all see that in in all sorts of you know like black mirror kind of uh, TV shows and stuff, but immediately, more immediately, like um, at least at, at the university level, and I've talked to you know industry colleagues um, as well. Is um, it's improved their workflows? Um, it's it's created um, like we're talking about you know kind of mid journey Dali kind of stuff for design sketching and visualization. Um, improve you know the 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 kind of outcomes more immediately, but also like for writing documents and stuff like that. Like mm. there's, it's, it's, there's still like a lot of work you have to do to, to, to put it together, a document, but it's actually making people's communication better because it, it's doing a lot of the middle work that you have to kind of sit there for hours, kind of fixing stuff. It's doing that bit really quickly, like mm. super quick. 
and then actually getting you to go, actually, that's what I want to say. And and if it's helping us achieve that, then it's actually just really good in terms of like helping us communicate what we want to communicate, right? Um, so yeah, I'm not disqualifying or kind of ignoring the dystopian things that could happen as a result of AI, but but certainly just immediately I've seen some really good benefits from students and, and in industry. Hmm. How do you deal with it, Raf? With you know, on the other end, on the the, the kind of plagiarism side, and uh, with assignments and and those sorts of things, from the university standpoint, I I think different it? disciplines, <laughs> yeah, different disciplines are, have different complexities, right? Like in design, there's not a lot of there is written stuff that we have to submit um, that students are required to submit, but um, they're pretty. Um, we're getting better bit of written stuff that's mm. the first thing um it doesn't you know mm. um uh chat gpt doesn't do uh referencing yet so they still have to go in and kind of reference the stuff appropriately and you know we we can check that quick quite quite easily um the this in terms of sketching um and and the workflows i haven't seen too much of them using that in their workflows this semester i'm gonna i'm sure that will come through um but it's it's um i i'm really seeing it as a positive thing um angus in terms of like i'm allowing them to use it and it's like just just recognize it as a tool and 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 you know show us you're working but you, you you're developing stuff on top of that right like yeah. use it as an initial you know starting point if you like but um you've obviously got to work on top of that to create your own based on you know the the, the project um brief um so I'm hoping in the short term, it's just going to be, it's going to improve some workflows uh, mm-hmm. for students. Yeah, it's important to have that freedom of experimentation too, to be able to just it is. try it out and see what, where you can go with it. And yeah, yeah. it's important. We, we we don't know where it's landing yet, like in terms of like, there's lots of conversations in academia around like, how do we allow students to use it? And, and what, what are the limits? What are the restrictions? All of this stuff. It's like, it's open slather right now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a brave new world. Yeah. It's funny. I graduated just as it came in, just before it came, just after it came in. So I just missed out on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's going to be interesting, um, even from a product design standpoint. Obviously, you guys are in that space. You know, how is a, how is AI going to be integrated into even a physical product? You know, level. Like I saw a couple of um, I saw a TED talk the other day where they integrated it into like a little device that you could wear on you, and you could kind of speak to it, and it would give you like almost like a Google Assistant kind of response um as like an everyday helper so you don't have to really bring your phone out and like glue yourself to the phone they were kind of talking about how it could be the future of you having less screen time instead of more screen time and i mean that's an interesting way to look at it so who knows hmm. there you can leave this one. Oh uh, no uh, what who was it for anyone anyone who anyway, was go for it, sir. <laughs> oh no 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 you go well i was thinking it's interesting about onboarding and and we put a fair bit of work in onboarding, right? Custom experience unboxing and bringing your product online, especially when we're talking about IoT products. Mm. So you've got the perfect platform to make that experience. And we do a lot of work in the aged care sector or elderly. Uh, we have a lot of devices that work in the elderly sector. So you imagine that's fairly intense, trying to get a seamless customer experience and onboarding experience when, um, you know, my mum and dad take a tech product out of a box. So you can imagine I'm, we're pretty excited about seeing how that, um, can plug in just like you're saying with the aid or the, the talk to kind of bot function is mm-hmm. it's effectively allowing it to self-drive its own onboarding process and help set itself up for um, potential customers. We, I guess we're excited by that. Um, mm-hmm. And then obviously in use context of issues, um, the kids say, Hey, I've got a problem with my battery or I've, you know, I, I've no longer got an internet connection. You need to do X, Y, Z. I don't know. There's all sorts of smarts that are mm-hmm. going to come from this, this uh, AI integration, which I think is going to be very good for people in general. Mm, yeah. I'm interested to see, I mean, in our industry of, or industries or agriculture and construction and heavy machinery, that sort of thing, how it's going to play into, you know, autonomous vehicles mm. and, you know, you get a field full of uh, driverless dozers working through the night uh, on a job and then, uh, you know, haulage coming to take that dirt away and um you know that will be at the moment that that type of thing is kind of at the remote control stage 
Mm. Um, it's not at the autonomous stage uh, yet, but um, how a lot of that learning um, through AI affects that mm. is going to be really interesting to see. Mm. I, like, I really like the humanization that it brings to technology and that it then becomes more like a friend or uh, and it can really like have a, a personalized experience to it. Um, now I read the other day that someone actually uh, trained there. I think it was his mother had died and he trained it with, with like text examples and stuff. And then, so then um, the AI would then speak in his mother's tongue um, or like bright. Um, and so he was able to sort of say his farewell, although he knew that it was a, an AI, he think he it was, it was giving him closure. So I think it's, um, it's some powerful things that we can do with it. Um, but there is a, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ethics that we need to figure out. That's some Black Mirror stuff right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I suppose in as designers, we're in that space where we have to be the ones to kind of gatekeep the future of the technology to some degree in the implementation in, you know, in the products we design. Um, you know, it's not, it's obviously not necessarily our responsibility. It's also a legislation responsibility kind of, um, you know, stopping, putting the hold on the unethical side of it. Um, but I suppose that we've already seen how quickly it has taken over the world, AI, and it's kind of crazy to think that what what it would even be like two years from now. Like, it's, you can't even really fathom what it, what it would be like two years from now. Mm. Yeah, it's true. And I think it is it is designer's role to always advocate, to be the advocate for the user and for humans, you know. Mm. Um and all of this technology is great and wonderful, but um, if it's misdirected and misguided uh, and we just forge ahead with it without really thinking how that applies to humans and how, you know, uh, people are going to use things, it's, it's, it's not going to end well. <laughs> so maybe just moving on from there, we've got Raf. So should we accept to see more designers? Oh, I already got that one. There you go. Number six. <laughs> cool. oh, it's, not, it's not doing very good at generating new ones. <laughs> Number four. It's a failure of AI. Yeah, so yeah, there, there, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> we've, we've, we've found its limits. <laughs> Panel discussion. Well, this is a very relevant one for Raf, so it works out well. Is it a okay. must to have industry experience as an academic? Um, in design, yes, I think so, um, to some degree. Hmm. Um, now, that industry experience can come in many different ways and forms um, because, as we've all talked about already, industry experience and, and, and the positives that you can bring into a project is not just skill sets but also, uh, um, you know, personal attributes, professionalism, a whole heap of other stuff that is not relevant to you know, skill sets that we traditionally think about as, as an industrial designer, as a designer. Um, but yes, I do. I, I, I've always believed. Um, so even before I became, you know, uh, an academic, um, I was, I always thought if I ever teach, especially in design, if I ever teach, I want to have my foot in industry to, to be able to discuss those, you know, the relevant topics. Um, to students and and talk about them um, in a way that I've experienced or I know of firsthand at least. Mm. Um, in other disciplines, that's not the case. In other fields, in other in, in you know um, that that's not necessarily the case. Theory, the theory is the practice in other fields sometimes, right? Um, but in design, you know, design for me is like it, it doesn't it. it the, the end to close the loop on design is like you have to make stuff in the world so mm -hmm. people experience it as angus as you said is like you know it's 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 for people um and so we have to know what it means in context and unless you do that then it, it, it's not finished it's not resolved yet as an idea or as a concept whatever um so yes i'm a big believer in it um in saying that of course as a an academic i see the place for theory i'm i'm a big big i understand that the strength and the power of theory uh, and its limitations hmm. just like i understand the strength and the power of practice and its limitations and it's it's somewhere in the middle where it's really important so 
if it's somewhere in the middle, that means that academics should have industry experience. And, you know, um, so yeah, answer is yes. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I actually think um, I, I, I would agree. But, and uh, I think that I I spent a couple of years doing some tutoring, uh, a final year student at QUT. And what I found in that experience was that I was kind of lacking on the theory, you know, like <laughs> I had this, um, I had, you know, all these practical examples of like, you know, really detailed injection molding details and data coding and, and chemical conversion coding of uh, die cast components and all of that. But the, the theory side of it, I was, I probably hadn't done so much since I left uni because I, you know, got got straight into it and and was, you know, worrying about um, tolerance stack ups for a long time. <laughs> and so I think it's a real, it it's a balance. It has yeah. to be a bit of both. And um, and I think it's important for students to to see that. And I I remember. Um, you know, uh, Vesna was running the course when I went through there and, you know, Vesna was always on about research, 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 research. And then I started working and I was like, when am I ever going to write a research document in my professional life? Nobody wants to pay for that. Right. But now I, I actually see it and I see uh, the value of it and the value of where that, when you don't do that properly, it, it really goes wrong, you know? Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's really important to get, to get a good balance of practical skills, but, you know, and, and like, I think we talked about it in our um, uh, podcast where like, if you were going to learn all the practical skills of industrial design at uni, the course would never end because there's just too much to learn, right. Mm -hmm. In every industry uh that that you could work in right so it's important to get that theoretical foundational knowledge and i still you know even though i'm a bit fuzzy on it these days it's been a while since i've been at uni um i still think back and i still draw from it you know so the balance is important i think mm. I'd, say, I'd second that i think you know i think it's this is not a pointed at raf or qt i think we've got a, we've got an industry-wide global problem at the moment where most of our university sector um, suppliers of students and talent is they've got best in theory but they're no longer providing best in practice and uh, that's the balance that's missing at the moment you know I can I can remember when I graduated uh, all those years ago you know going into CMD as a young graduate I was able to provide best in practice skills on Rhino right I was schooling the old dudes on Rhino because my tutors were best in practice tutors on Rhino um so that's that's long gone that's 20 years gone since or maybe 10 years gone since we had best in practice skills being taught at universities and i'm talking i'm talking globally um where your industry your industry employers are still best in practice and not learning anything from the graduates in fact they're just teaching them best in practice skills um so i think that we've lost that balance we've got best in theory being taught everywhere or well, most places but we don't have best in practice anymore so it's a concern for design directors like like myself and Sarah and Angus that we don't have we don't have we've got a really big employability problem at the moment, for sure. Yeah, I do see a lot of um, graduates they coming out, not really wanting to 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 um, get into the nuts and bolts of design, hmm. and I and I think you know not not really understanding what an M six machine thread is, you know uh and and i mean i know like i said you can't learn everything right but there are there are some some basic things and i don't know whether it's um uh a generational thing or uh whether it's whether it's i don't know i don't know but i think that you know the practical side of things uh really is really does need to be ramped up a bit in general mm. yeah. okay. Yeah. I mean, you, you've also got to look at, um, like, we noticed that in the tail end of the auxiliary programs that we're running, that um, we, we started to see the start of the STEM-only high school programs in Brisbane, right, where our students were coming through from Griffith or, or QT, and they'd gone to high schools that were STEM-only, right? So they didn't do home ec, they didn't do shop A, they didn't do shop B. Sure, it was available, but it wasn't really part of their priority culturally or, or available in terms of the mechanism of their high school. So we didn't have any of those sort of practical skills 
and we're not we're not seeing those practical skills coming through um, in in young graduates as well. So we're sort of getting this um, there's a cultural shift or a society shift as well as a um, a focus shift I think from unis globally as well. Mm. Yeah, I suppose um, from my perspective, I've noticed as well that there's it's very hard, I feel like, to teach the right thing necessarily for everyone because there's so much diversity now. Like like on one end, you could you could be you could be epi and you could end up in, you know, CGI where you'd probably never really need those practical skills um of like, I don't know, nuts and bolts. I mean, he does he does that as well, but you know what I mean? Like it's a very different career to like working in a manufacturing space. Um, and it's like, how can you teach everyone, no matter what path they're in? It's almost a different degree at that point, you know. What I mean? And and I suppose in Australia as well, we we don't necessarily have as many specialized degrees as they do overseas. So like maybe CGI going into like a CGI field would be a specific degree in 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 Europe. I'm not sure. Whereas here, it kind of fits under design in general. So it's like I suppose at that point, it's it's difficult to teach everything. And like from my, my from my standpoint, I got taught a really um a really good like conceptual belief of design and like I was taught to be passionate about design in a way like which I feel like is almost more important sometimes than um application because that you can learn that later if you have that passion um and I was taught you know so many different things like a very wide um learning experience and yeah I suppose it, it, at that point it, it, it makes it really hard to tailor for everyone and every need so I agree with that and also just industrial design is so big but mm. what I find it is a core skill especially for a consultant is that you learn how to research about the area that you don't know mm. and figure out what so like agriculture product okay well I have no idea what this is about and then you figure out okay what, what don't I know and then you start filling in those gaps yeah um to add into that Sarah is is like um educating students on how to be lifelong learners um like how to learn well how to learn fast how to pick things up well those are those are skill sets that because you don't know where you end up as a as a you know as an 18 19 year old um later in life but being able to absorb things and understand and pick things up quickly and 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 and, and you know think on your feet and 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 absorb from the right mentors and all of those things that you do as a professional um, is is actually really really critical for a you know a sustainable career in in whatever part of design you you end up being mm -hmm. um, and even if you focus on um, a particular area in design as soon as you go to a new job there's a lot of relearning that you have to do even if you've been in that role before right um, it, it's labeled the same but a new a new job a new location a new place will mean a whole lot of uplearning that you'll need to do as a as a as a professional um so teaching some of those skills are, are just as important as you know say the technical skills that we find are maybe the ones that you know are broadly accepted as the the the, the important technical skills that you need as a professional moving forward mm. so yeah just adding to that just um there's the sort of job titles and descriptions and uh, and tasks that we're doing, like that we're educating for today. It might not be what they're going to be doing in the future. So we need to make sure that it's it's more the foundational skills of like how do you learn that's important. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, to move on from that, going to Sarah again. Will three D printing bring about the end of mass manufacturing? Oh. That's a tricky one. Um, yes and no. Uh, like it's not there yet. I'd I'd love to. There's some. So. The the biggest difference between um well the way that we design right now is that we design for processes. Mm. So if you're doing injection molding, you need like one to three degrees draft. There is a objects look the way they do because of their manufacturing methods and how we can create it. So, um, but to a degree, actually, um, the um, 3D printing also does that. Mm. So, for instance, if you're printing with like a, a liquid, you need to have drainage holes, so you need to have it on a certain degree. Mm. Um, I don't think it's going to replace it, um, but I am welcoming it 
as a way of manufacturing because that means that we can do local runs. We don't need to do like one mass manufacturing runs of like several thousand. You could do a couple. And so from a sustainability perspective, that's really good because mm. uh, then you, you don't need to ship materials around. The, well, you might still have to, but hopefully you can source it locally. Um, so I think it's, it's not going to replace it, but I think it's going to add to it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I think that's that's actually the perfect statement that I, um, I'm looking forward to it getting to a point where we can actually start um, taking advantage of that. Uh, and I and from a sustainability point of view, yeah, awesome. Um, because I mean, at Topcon, we are producing relatively low volume stuff that is high value and has to withstand ridiculous environmental conditions. So a lot of the, a lot of our enclosures are, are, are die cast or thixo molded. Um, but, and, and, and with that comes a lot of, you know, energy that, that goes into um, producing all of that. Um, if I could 3D print the same enclosures, that would be amazing because mm. the other part of that is that it's infinitely adjustable. You know, you haven't got a tool that you've sunk $100,000 into mm. that then costs another, you know, $30,000 to change. You, you, can, um, you can modify things. Um, and the flexibility that that gives, um, I think, you know, it's not quite there yet. And I'm just like hoping and praying, you know, like just maybe another five years, you know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm looking forward to the day where we can, where we can utilize that, on, you know, for production parts. Mm. Yeah, I, I just back all that up. I, just, I think it's amazing to see where we've come in, in my career. You know, I can remember Craig coming out with this long laminated prototype, which was layered blue um, die cut sheets of paper going, how cool is this? And then here I am, I do the same thing to these guys going, we just printed this in 12 hours and we can use it. It's amazing, <laughs> you know, and as you say, if we have the same curve, we'll be... Uh, Will be many, will be not. It's an interesting role for us then, because suddenly we will take on a role of a maybe a batch manufacturing um, provider as well as a design house, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, and, and yeah. we get to do what the the software people are doing. We get to be agile. We get to like fail and fail again and like refine stuff. And that's yes. sometimes a little bit hard in in uh, hardware. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, there's also some really cutting edge stuff that's coming out of applying this, um, Roman, like, um, we've, we've got a, um, well, one of our students went and did an internship at Adidas, um, and they're working really, really, um, you know, on the, on the cusp of the cutting edge with 3d printing for, for shoes. Um, so printing different, different types of materials, different kind of, um, uh, um, aspects to those materials in the one print. So mm. they, they can perform differently. So you have lower, middle and upper sole in the one print. Um, and, you know, it's still not quite there yet, but it's pretty close. And, you know, the student is kind of generating uh, potentially a business out of the internship and what he learned and picked up there to produce, you know, very bespoke, very unique, very high end, um, mm. you know, kind of shoe concepts and shoe designs for, for athletes. Mm. Um, and so that, you know, the, 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 the entry point for that is, 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 is so, so much, so lower than what it would be for, you know, traditionally mass manufacturing kind of approach. Um, and, and the capabilities that that's providing is, is it far outstrips, you know, what other kind of approaches you'd be able to apply on it. Um, so it's really interesting. It's it's really really cool. Um, yeah, what's possible? It's, it's even interesting from a, a another standpoint, another job you can move into now. Like this this field of three D printing wasn't necessarily a job possibility maybe five years ago. Um, are you familiar with you know Ethan? I can't remember his last name. Ethan from my graduate year. He just got a job as a three D printing technician in Brisbane, and you know what I mean. Awesome. Like that's that's a like he he studied industrial design and almost didn't want to take it, but. Apparently he's really been enjoying it and it's, it's yeah, basically a full-time position using different materials, different types of resins, um, all around 3D printing. So now it can be even another field of industrial design, another branch of industrial design. Either. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome.
Mm. I'm looking forward to getting some of the more the qualities, the material qual qualities that we can get with um, uh, like tooled objects. Mm -hmm. So for instance, MDF printers, they are, they have layers and then there's air gaps in between the layers. So although it's great for visual prototyping, it doesn't have the same strength. Mm. Um, so we are seeing some more um, uh, machines that are coming out with some, well, more interesting solutions. Um, but I think that's really, that's one of the key things that needs to change before um, it can be um, seen as a, a real option to manufacturing. Mm. And, and just to add to that, it's like beyond product design is we're talking about their med health field, you know, like QUT is a world leader in that space as well. It's like 3D printers have been able to, you know, depending on how you apply it and what kind of material you're using is utilizing, you know, scaffolding in for bones and for growing skin and, you know, all sorts of stuff in the body that you just can't do with almost any other kind of, you know, um, technique. Um, and yeah, like Sarah said, you know, you can, you can fail fast and fail often doing this pro process um, and, and, and really um, uh, increase the, the or, or sorry, decrease the time frame that you can go from, you know, an idea to something that is, in, you know, applied as a med health kind of application. Mm -hmm. um, that's a totally different area where the skill sets from a design play a really important role. You know, like you're saying, Ethan becomes, he could be like, you know, an expert at 3D printing in the med health space that has nothing mm -hmm. to do with like mass manufacturing of products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, to move on from there, maybe Neil, if you'd like to answer this one, how can we foster a more inclusive design culture that attracts women to the um, to the the prospect of a career in industrial design? <laughs> uh, well, um, I guess you know what, it's interesting, right? Because we 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 have, and Ralph, you can probably let me know what the statistics are, but I'm pretty sure I was reading an article a few years ago. I was suggesting that 75 percent of most design courses around the world are actually female. And, and that was for industrial designers. So it may be different in Australian context, but this was, a, a, I think, an American study. But then, like, one year out in industry, um, our industry retention or absorption or in, in placement was that was down to less than 3%. So as, as a sector where we, we retain female staff worse than mining sector i think mining does better and i guess you might have to <laughs> prove me on that one but i'm pretty sure mining has a better female retention in staff load than, than industrial design does so so how do we, you know and i guess my consultancy is interesting that you know and, and sarah's attributed to that we've got more than 50 percent of our staff are female mm -hmm. um and it wasn't the way like this has happened through good good luck as opposed to strategy and foresight for me um you know i think back to the day the sand when we had you know 20 something designers and, and two staff were female in that group. Um, and I was running the design management side of the business then for Craig and, and you know, I think how poor and how non-democratic and how biased all our work was, right? Um, and now with this team, like, they can't help but be biased because the girls will just walk past a hand tool prototype, pick it up and tell the male designer that they're being knobheads and they need to fix it. <laughs> so you know it's 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 interesting how much better it is as a workplace not just from culture but from design output having a more gender biased so gender balanced design team mm. um and i'll probably let sarah talk more about her experiences mm. directly but you know what has it taken us to get to that well a whole whole lot of extra training i guess and not because the girls um don't lack the talent um, or, or the determination or the tenacity, it's usually us backfilling a whole bunch of experiential gaps in their past that started way back to how we raise our girls as adults, as parents, if you know what I mean, uh, how society tends to funnel behaviours and education right back at primary school, kindergarten, or even pre-kindergarten, all the way through high school, you know, home economics for girls, shop aid for guys. Um, and it's 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 literally taking the time, and it could be up to two years of training just to do experiential gap filling. Um, that I, you know, the first projects the junior female designers will do for us is usually for someone for a client like Max Tracks doing four-wheel drive recovery equipment, something so alien to their current exposure 
that they're getting thrown in the deep end, but they're getting exposure to mechanical mechanisms and industri industrial mechanisms. And, and I'm giving them the, the time and patience and the confidence and the space to really own that space and learn and get their confidence up. So just sort of backfilling it. And once they, once they understand the experiential um, background of something, they get it and then they own it. And then what I, what I love, what I found over time is um, the girls tend to be better designers. And it's because of, it's because of their attention to detail. Mm. Guys get a little bit relaxed, a little bit blase. She'll be right. And they don't check things three times where I think it's a mass stereotype, I know. But I just, you know, I'll be kicking the girls out of here going, what are you doing? Go home. And I'm like, I just want to check this form one more time. The guys are already at the pub, right? There's something about the female psyche i guess or, or what that just says i'm going to check this one more time there's a diligence level that's uh a diligence and attention to detail that i really appreciate as a design owner um so that's sort of my insights but it does take time to, to backfill i guess the gaps that our society and our education is uh burdened female design graduates with mm. i think a important role as well is mentorship so when I started in the industry, I didn't know of any female senior industrial designers. And so I kind of had to just, well, try to figure it out as I was doing it. Just like small things like how do you, how do you dress for like the design studio? Mm. Or like, how do you, like what's an appropriate like communication behavior? Because the, the challenges with being, especially when you're young and female is that people just don't take you seriously. Mm. Um, I had... Well, when, when I was like, um, we had a pretty flat, um, like hierarchy um, where I worked and then, and so I would like offer coffees and then they're like, oh yeah, you're the receptionist. I'm like, no, I'm the designer on your project, but you know, I'll get you your coffee. That's cool. Um, so it's just, uh, it's just navigating those things because they can be, they can, they can be annoying sometimes and it's not by malice and I think that's important to distinguish it's just by um subconscious biases that we have and um and so actually just educating yourself on those as well and then having someone to kind of figure out like how how to navigate this so I think the higher you you climb the ladder as a female industrial designer you really need to um try to give mentorship to those um, who are under you to sort of just lift them up. Mm. Mm. I'm going to send my niece to see you, Sarah. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> she, <laughs> she's in grade 11. But, Excellent. Uh, yeah, that's where, that's where she wants to be. And it's, yeah, it's people like yourself that, that is going to inspire the younger mm. generation because I think, yeah, um, a lot of girls just need to see that they, that, that there's a pathway. It's, yeah. it's hard to see what you and I to become what you can't see. Yes, that's yeah. right. And I mean, I don't know, would I would you say that uh, in your career so far, you've probably had to work harder than all the other guys, the, the males to get to where you are? Um, I, I have worked really hard. And I think I've also put that onto myself because I need to prove myself. Yeah. And um, so, but, you know, I work with amazing people. I'm sure they, they push themselves really hard too. Um, mm. But it's definitely a thing because you're coming from a disadvantage. Yes. And you just need to sort of work through that. And you need to prove that like, yes, you're worthy of being in the room and you're worthy of working on that project. And then once you've sort of won them over, like it's, it's completely fine. But that initial, um, just not having that automatic... Um, respect that yeah. other other male your your seniority and age will have and um, that can be a challenge and I, I see it in our own studio as well just um the females um calling up suppliers and they're just really not being cooperative but then if you have a guy calling up they're like yeah sure mate you know no problem yeah so it's just it's it's just, it's a bit fucked yeah. i remember i remember like when sarah was a junior designer just i had the i had the, the uh, pleasure and honor of, of training Sarah many years ago when I was at CMD and and I remember I, talk, I just launched in and said right for this mechanism we're going to do a racking pinion style gearbox and just transfer the power through 90 degrees and do that and she looked and she called me out she said what the hell are you talking about and once I explained to her again in a sketch schematic she's like I hadn't even finished the sketch and she's like oh I get it I understand what you're talking about now but I didn't know the terminology I didn't know what the context of use was but it was 
without even finishing the sketch, Sarah, I'd understood the mechanism was ready to apply it in her mind's CAD and then into the real CAD. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself afterwards, when did I first come across that? And I was building a go-kart with dad when I was like seven, mm -hmm. you know? And I think, you know, him explaining to me what that mechanism was and how that's going to work. And that's, you know, that's that's the disadvantage we're talking about, right, between our education, so, or experiences, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, well, I was raised by a, um, a single mum, so I don't really, I didn't really have a, a father figure growing up. Uh, so I like, I missed out on a lot of skills just, well, um, through childhood on that side. Um, but I feel like, so I had some real catching up to do when I started working in industry. Um, but Neil was really patient with me. And I think, uh, yeah, here we are 14 years later and it's, uh, yeah, it's good. What's it like for, for your industry, Angus? I'm interested in seeing how that is for you, mate. Oh, it's so hard to, um, you know, in this office here, we've got 70 people. Um, and what I've seen over the last probably six or so years is there's definitely more, um, there's more females joining the office, which is great, but uh, it's a massive, um, you know, imbalance. I mean, We've got a lot of a uh, lot of software developers here. Um, I mean, the the industrial design team um, is really kind of a small part of this office. It's mostly software developers, and that's it's kind of the same. You know, there's I would say it would be probably ninety percent male, ten percent female. Uh, but interestingly, in Topcom, we have a lot of um, female uh, upper management and and uh, females in, in very key upper management positions and, um, and, and which is great, you know, and I think that actually might be more of an American thing. Mm -hmm. um, it tends to be less of a, there tends to be less of a, a, of a difference there than there is. Australia is pretty bad, I think, um, you know, on the world stage. Uh, but it, yeah, I don't know. The US tends to be maybe a little bit, a little bit better. But um, I'm actually really thankful for our female leaders um, because they bring um, a lot of common sense and no ego to the table, which is refreshing. Hmm. What are you seeing at uni, Rafa? What, what sort of numbers are you seeing? Seeing more girls than guys in the classes, or is it sort of fifty fifty? Um. Neil, you know, like a few years after you and I finished, there was a real increase in females. We we almost had um, 60, 40 females at one point. Um, so that was maybe 10 years out. That was the high point. Um, so, you know, about 10 years ago. And then then it dropped it dropped right off. Like we, we had a good five or six years where it was like heavily male dominated again. And we're only starting to see that change recently. So the last few years, we've got a bit of a better balance. Um, and even through to final year, which is good. But there's, there, there's, it's been really quite strange in terms of the, 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 the flux um, of, of representation. And I think one, of the, one other thing that, that plays a role is, is um, you know, senior and high school um, in, in Queensland. So... Um, you know, having worked with QCAA, uh, who write all the curriculum for high schools and stuff, um, one of the things, the design and tech course, which is a, a really important kind of feeder into the design and tech kind of disciplines that, that, that students go into, it's not like, firstly, the, the, it's not a required um, course that, 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 that high schools need to give. So they elect to 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 you know, teach it or not. And usually the schools that elect to teach it are the ones who have the facilities, the workshops and the stuff already there, which is usually the all boys private schools. <laughs> so it, 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 it like centers around there um, because then there, are, there aren't a lot of schools that are going to, um, you know, put up or fork up the money to create whole new kind of classrooms and infrastructure, um, you know, in, in different disciplines to to absorb that kind of um teaching um kind of stuff so yeah we've got a, a a real problem kind of at least in queensland in the schooling system um that feeds up into you know the fundamental skills that need to be taught there that would then help students think about going oh yeah i want 
I do that for my career in, in university and onwards. So, yeah, yeah would, it's a lot of problems. I would say that it's my experience of being the father of two girls and looking at schools. Um, and, yeah, the, the girls' schools, I suppose, um, uh, probably in the last few years uh, have started that uptake, but definitely it was the boys' schools were way ahead. They, all, they had all that stuff nailed. And, and, and it was still, you know, we go and look at the girls' schools and it was home ec. And there might, as part of that, there might be a little bit of a, a fashion design component, um, but nothing really more towards mm. industrial design. Um, what, what was interesting to me was my, my eldest daughter went to uh, the, um, uh, went to Quacky at, at Kelvin Grove and, and they have a really good industrial, uh, not really, it's not industrial design, it's not called that, but uh, the, the IB program. I went there and and looked at it and I was like, man, I want to go here. This is really good. Those kids were 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 doing some outstanding work. It just you know, grade ten and eleven and twelve, um, it was amazing. And that was that environment was 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 terrific. It was really good to see. Um, but I think um, yeah, also knowing a couple of teachers um, and and knowing that you know, as art teachers, you are suddenly then told, okay, you're going to teach design now, and um, yeah, that. They're not really equipped. They don't. They can, there's the curriculum's written there, right? But there's a lot of problems, Angus. It's yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's like a, a staffing issue. Yeah. There's like an infrastructure issue. Um, there's also like you know uh, government priority areas. Like they're mm-hmm. they're funding stuff around STEM and other things that that you know like specifically um, you know carve out things that they're funding. Um, yeah. So there's there's a different levels of different yeah, areas. Yeah. I think it's, I think it would be really good for people of our, you know, of all of us, people who have been doing design for a while and, and um, have had a bit of experience to, to engage with schools, um, you know, going into schools. I mean, I, I was in like in a lucky position where my sister-in-law was an art teacher and had to start teaching design and she called me up and was like, you've got to help me. And so I went in and, and gave a bit of a talk to the kids and, and they're all keen. They want to learn and, and, they just it needs to they need to get off on the right foot. But um, you know, tutoring at university is one thing, but um, somehow getting into the schools, I think, to really um, get all these kids knowing that they can do this. You know, especially the girls who who might not even really consider it as an option. They might not even know that um, this thing that they use every day was actually designed by someone and you know mm. not just the outside but the, the software as well so you know um i think making those connections and having those light bulb moments for those kids earlier on um is gonna really help to set them along the path mm. and then it's also a matter of, of keeping the women in their roles because there's a lot of hurdles so one one like elephant in the room is um, what happens uh, with motherhood. Um, yeah. So um, I just I have a toddler, and I uh, up up until well, I probably didn't feel like um, I felt like I needed to have my career in a certain space and to um, to reach a certain seniority before I was really comfortable stepping out uh, on maternity leave and sort of having kids, um, and I. If, if I feel that way, I'm sure a lot of other women do too, because there is um, um, what happens when they come back. Do they actually get their career back on track? Like I've been incredibly lucky. So I'm, I stepped back in after nine months and then now two years after I'm design director. So I <laughs> I made it through. So I'm, I'm very happy about that, but it's challenging um, and it's we need to support women who wants to work um, mm. to figure to give them flexibility and not um, if they come back in a part-time um, role, then, you know, still give them good projects. Still don't just don't just give them like admin roles because, you know, if you're not there all the time, you're not committed. That's just bullshit. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of areas there that needs to be improved um and also from like a political point of view just um like childcare 
if you can get childcare more accessible, that will help a lot of women coming back into the workforce after they have had kids. Um, and yeah, so I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges to how to keep women in design. And I think it's just, it's it's not just one solution. There's solutions all the way through from like childhood and education and disability to like, okay, well, seniority, how do you, um, how do you even find mentors, right? Or um, or what happens when you have kids and how, how does that impact your career? So just from um, like my, um, my own, um, experience is that is that it's actually going through like pregnancy and it's just given me a lot of new lenses um so it's just for instance um seat belts right mm -hmm. you, do you question seat belts like how do they make you feel when you are in a car fine oh, oh, fine. yeah i thought yeah, so too. totally fine <laughs> but if you are like in your third semester and you have a huge belly and you have a seat belt that just sits diagonally across the belly like on the baby you are terrified right yeah. so and i mean if if women were in charge of designing car seats or and, and seat belts fuck no that would not happen like we would have like these beautiful five point harnesses because it's it's very dangerous but it's just you you can't I didn't realize that that was an issue until I experienced it hmm. and also now as a parent I see all these like dangerous things on products like oh shit this battery <laughs> this is really bad you know my boy can swallow that um so it's not just I think my point also is that it's not just about females it's about diversity hmm. it's about having people on your team with a lot of different experiences life experiences now that could be like immigrants but it can also be people from different like classes of society um gender um like i'm really happy because in our team we have such huge differences in in interests and hobbies like we have surf life savers we have people that love gardening or um, art so it's just an all those things you 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 bring all your experiences to design and it's giving you these like unique lenses that you see it through and what's what i would probably okay <laughs> um back in the days i feel like the industrial design studios were kind of like it was a copy paste of like one dude that loves bikes motorbikes coffee you know like you all know the guy right so I'm very I'm happy. Looking at us all here right now. <laughs> Putting a little bit of nerve here, yeah, but um, like, and you guys are lovely. Just don't get me wrong, but it's <laughs> it's amazing to see a little bit more um diversity in the team, and um, just because it it brings so much better um solutions because we all come from different viewpoints and then we can have a, an honest discussion about like, okay, well, how would that work for the user? Because the user is not necessarily a mid 30 something guy that loves motorcycles. It might be your mom. It might be like someone really young. So you need all of these lenses to be able to really um, get a holistic perspective over what you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, it's That's been quite right. interesting with clients knowing that we have such a <clears throat> large number of female designers in our team, how they start to look to us for female insight leadership, which which is great. But obviously we, we encourage them to go and do some ethno research themselves. But it's just changed that conversation where normally that wouldn't even, well, it, it wouldn't come wouldn't come about as often or at all. Um, you know, and I guess, you know, talking as, at the time I was Sarah's boss, not necessarily her co-director, but, you know, I had those concerns you know how how it all worked but i was kind of in the back of my mind i knew who sarah was and knew how capable she was so i wasn't that concerned about her you know going becoming a mum and coming back part-time but what mm -hmm. i've noticed is she's been you know like like all of our mothers she's been given this secret mum power right which supercharges her efficiency and her efficacy and and it's like yeah, sure. She's back to four days a week, but she's getting six days worth of work done in four days a week. So I guess <laughs> if there's a little bit of learnings I've had is it's embrace embrace the power of the mum. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, it's incredible how efficient um, she is in particular. But thinking about all our mothers, they're, they're pretty powerful um, people, really. 
and having a child like it's all about problem solving like why is the child crying like it is <laughs> so so many things that you need to think about mm. yeah well moving on from that maybe we'll go to angus next Will autonomous vehicles revolutionize city spaces and bring an end to driving for enjoyment? Oh, that's a good question. I, I hope not. Um, I hope that they will still be driving for enjoyment. Um, yeah, uh, but, you know, I think autonomous vehicles are probably something that that are coming, you know, like it, it's, it, it's not going to be that long, I think, before it's, the norm rather than the exception. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, it's like any of these technologies we've been talking about, like 3d printing, you know, like remember, well, I don't remember, but I've read about when Bakelite, you know, you know was a product mm. that, uh, and, and, you know, all sorts of revolutionary product, but all sorts of problems with, with it, it was a brittle and, and, um, but, and think of the engineering plastics that we have, you know, nowadays that can replace metal. It's it's come such a long way and it, you know, it's taken some time, but, you know, in 3D printing, I mean, it's come from uh, something really crude to like, we're almost there where we can use it in in prototype, in uh, production. So I think, you know, this is another, um, another thing that, that I think maybe in 20 years time, the, the streets will probably be full of autonomous vehicles. I mean, I don't know how the insurance industry is going to, deal with that no i would wouldn't want to be trying to solve that problem but um yeah i think it's i think it's coming but in terms of driving for for enjoyment i think there will still be people that that do that and that that will, it might become a bit more niche you know um but i can't i can't see that ever dying um you know less and less people are getting their manual license these days which which is um I don't know, a bit disappointing, but at the same time, understandable because, you know, car, automatic cars are better, aren't they, than what they used to be when I, when I got my license, you, you know, you couldn't really rely on an automatic car that was one that I could afford. So, <laughs> um, uh, so I mean, yeah, I don't know what anyone else thinks, but um, I, I think we're, they're going to be autonomous vehicles will be on the streets. I give it 20 years is my prediction. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I look forward, I, I, when I'm in explore mode and going for a drive on the weekend and, you know, I'll, I'll be, I stop so often that there's no way an AI car is going to cope with my random instructions of stop, look at that, an eagle, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'll enjoy the Sunday driving, but if I'm commuting, you know, backwards and forwards from the coast or going to a meeting in Toowoomba or something, I'd be quite happy to kick back and get on the emails or make some phone calls or engage with the work side and, Every time I travel on a flight and have a three-hour flight or a five-hour flight, I get so much, as long as there's good internet connection, get so much work done. It's amazing. It kind of frees up my whole day. So I guess I look forward to the autonomy side kicking in and helping me with my productivity. But I'm like you, man. I enjoy driving and I enjoy exploring and stopping and engaging so much with the environment that yeah, I, I want it, to preserve that. It might mean that, you know, the cars that we own are more specialised and the cars that we commute in, we don't own. Yeah, you know it, that whole shift um, m might happen, and I'll, and I'll end up just you know driving a go kart everywhere because it's fun, you know. <laughs> Ralph, um, would you Hello. like to speak to this? Um, you're connected with BMW Group, so I feel like you would definitely yeah. have insights. Yeah, um, from the stuff I know uh, that we work with the BMW Group, one of the things that is really interesting is um, the the idea of like autonomous vehicles that we see in movies where everything's driving by itself everywhere. Mm. They predicted that's never going to happen. Like mm. never. There's too many technical challenges and too many legal challenges mm. around that. Um, autonomous vehicles as a concept will exist. And, and as Angus, as you said, um, I think it's probably faster than 20 years um, in terms of that. But but it's going to be in very specific cases like highway driving or, you know, specific like routes that, that are designated to be autonomous and things like that. Um, so when you can control all, you know, a lot of the environment conditions, then autonomous driving becomes possible. 
Um, but in terms of like trying to manage all the, the, you know, like Neil, like you said, you know, the weekend driving and you're doing random stuff and it just, there's just, it's, it just not capable of doing all of that. Mm. Um, but, you know, we're already seeing like the, 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 the seeds of that in, in some of the work we do with the logistics and factory stuff that all over the uh, BMW directly that I work with, but, but just all over the place. Um, the, the, the way the, the, the processes, the workflows to getting, you know, autonomous vehicles um, learning and functioning and all of that, it's, it's, it's already in, 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 the, in the industry. Um, it just hasn't been applied directly into, you know, the, the kind of vehicle context. Mm. Um, but I, I certainly see, um, you know, there, there might even be times during a drive when you can go autonomously and then go back to, you know, manual driving, things like that. So those visions are very, very clear for at least the stuff I know about BMW, you know, firsthand. Mm, okay. Well, yeah, um, to move on from there. Do you want to talk about your perspective on that? You mean? Yeah, are you saying you've got an interesting perspective on cars? Well, I uh, I welcome the autonomous car. I, I don't drive for pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Not like Neil. Yep. Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting how, you know, everyone can have such a different perspective on the simple practice of driving, you know, like some, some enjoy it. Like I'm sure my girlfriend, if, if I gave her the option to hop in a self-driving vehicle and get to work every day, she'd probably be like, sign me up, you know, whereas me personally, I'm on the other side of it. And it's like, how can you design something to fit with all these different types of perspectives when you like, like, as we know, autonomous vehicles won't work if half the people on the road aren't using them. And that's that's going to be the struggle, which I, I think is going to be the biggest issue of implementation. So. I think also one thing is the safety aspect. So if we do have much, so yes, there's going to be accidents and it's more horrible when it happens because there's no clear fault. Mm. Um, but there are so many people killed every year from um, auto automobile accidents. And I think, yeah, just... Uh, reducing that would be amazing mm. um, but it, it it needs to be a bit of a culture shift as well but I, I think we are seeing trends where young people aren't necessarily getting licenses and aren't so interested in cars cars aren't anymore this liberator that gives you freedom to go places because we can take an uber now you can take public transportation mm. um so yeah it's just going to be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of generations mm. yeah definitely I'm going to Raf now. What lessons have you learned along your career that you wish to share? And I feel like this is a big one. Everyone here has had very extensive careers of many different experiences. If everyone would like to share something that they think could help out, um, you know, a member of the audience. Oh yeah, no, I'd love to hear everyone's. Um, um, it's interesting as you know, as someone who who tries to do their best to educate the, the, the next, you know, generation of designers. Um, I'm a massive believer in like following your passion in what, whatever you do, whether it's design, design adjacent or not. Um, I've had many students who have come to me and I've noticed that their passion doesn't lie in design. And I said, you know, don't go, focus on what you really love focus on, on what you really enjoy because then you will achieve great things because you'll when 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 difficult challenges you when you're faced with difficult challenges you will just persist you will continue moving forward because you genuinely love this area I mean everything you know we've all all of us here are faced with challenges in our careers but if you love what you do you just you go yeah okay it's just another thing I've got to overcome and you know it's, it's easy, right? Not easy, but it, you can see the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Whereas when those challenges hit you and you're not doing what you love, it's just, it's, it's, it's incredible that that wall, wall that comes up, you know, psychologically, emotionally, physically, all sorts of ways. Um, so I know it's, it's a very vague kind of concept, but this idea of like, especially for young designers, which is what I care about, is like um, following your passion um, is, is just so, so important. Um, and 
you know, luckily I feel like I've been able to do that in my own career. Um, I found something that I loved and, you know, I chased, I chased projects that I love as an academic. I have the liberty to do that. Um, and then I can bring that back and inspire the next generation of designers. And honestly, until right now, this moment, I can honestly say that, you know, they're, they're, um, I've, I've loved and enjoyed everything. And that's why I put the passion and, and the energy towards it. Um, and, and I think if, if other students and, and other future designers can, can find that, then it solves so many problems for you in terms of, you know, professional challenges that you face further on down the track. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think probably go next. Never stop learning. And by that, I mean, it's uh, industrial zone is so wide and you need you need a lot of different information. So it's not just about design. You need to know about technology. You need to keep up to date with things. So just keep your interest varied and just test the, the net broad just to, to expose yourself to as much as possible. Um, because you never know that little gold nugget from like an article you read like three months ago, how that's going to be relevant for something in the future. Mm. Mm. Yep. I would I would agree with that. I think for me the um the thing that I've always tried to do is be aware all the time of everything. Even you know, walking past a bus shelter and there's a little detail that looks cool, and you stop and have a look and just take note of how that was done. And and I do that all the time, and it drives my wife crazy. But we you know that. And, and like make mental notes of all of those sorts of things. But more importantly, I think the, if I was going to give a young designer a piece of advice, it would be to always be aware of the people that you're working with and whether it be good or bad, you always take something from, from the people around you. Like it's really important to listen to, to everyone that you're working with. And it might not be another designer it might be an accountant or it might be, uh, you know, a machine operator, uh, <clears throat> everyone has a different point of view. And that's kind of how you innovate is, you know, I think Sarah made the point before, you know, you have different, you look through different lens, everyone looks through a different lens and, and, and someone's point of view on what you might be talking about might be completely different. And that what they take away from that is totally different from what you meant, but that can then spark something else. I think I've always you know take a note of the people around me the leaders around me good and bad there's been some real bad ones but there's been some really good ones and I think you can as you go through your career you kind of take note of like all right I'm never going to do what that guy do does uh, and then you, then you cherry pick from someone else and say all right you know um, one of the one of the greatest bosses I ever had was was Glenn Bevan at, at Infinity you know he was he's an amazing person and very very patient uh, very measured, um, uh, very passionate about design, and and um, and a really loyal boss. And and so, yeah, you know, a lot of times, I when I'm managing people here, I'm like, okay, well, what would Glenn do? Turn off some GV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, I think taking note of all the people around you and building that into into the way you do things is really important. Mm. So I was going to talk about endless curiosity, but you guys have nailed that. I think that's basically that, that in essence. The other one is, is and I drive my guys here bonkers with it, but identifying, and it's pretty it's a pretty hard task to do it, but identifying when you're making an assumption and never make assumptions, right? So it can come down to the most benign thing, like are you sure the faster company has M6s in stock? And they're like, yeah, they did last week. Oh, that's an assumption they have it this week. And you call them up and they're like, oh, actually, they're, the country's out of M6s because of COVID. Right, well, the whole product's effed because you can't put it together because you made the assumption last week that they have M6s, right? So coming back to, you know, Raf's coming a little bit. Often in my life when I've had these fairly big problems that have confronted me as a young designer, it's because I've let an assumption creep into my workflow and I've just assumed that something will be right when it so isn't, you know. And, um, and it's an interesting skill to have and I, I constantly challenge these guys every day that 
as soon as I hear them say, well, did you check this? Or did you do that? Or how did you come to that outcome? And you can see that there's been two or three assumptions made in that process. You're like, right, alarm bells, red flag, let's go and check that the supplier you talked to last year is still the same supplier this year, right? And these sort of things, are, I guess it's a logistical thing, but it, it often kills problems out before they even come up. Mm. So assumptions are you the just enemy. brought back a whole heap of PTSD of projects that have gone wrong for me. But now <laughs> just remembering those assumptions I made and where it went bad. Assumptions so, are evil. Kill assumptions. Really are. Exactly. Yeah, yep. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Well, we better wrap this up because I don't, you know, you guys got to get home. I got to have my dinner. But yeah, thank you so much for coming around. Just just to wrap everything up, one last question. Um, when we live in a world of visual pollution, everything around us, whether it be that marketing or, you know, Google that seeing the same products as everyone else, you know, everything around us is polluting our creativity. How can we as designers break out from that and really think freely in the world we live in? Um, if we want to go with who are we up to? I can't even remember. I think we're back to Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I say bring it on. I think it's it's good to take everything in, but um, but you also need to give yourself some downtime so that it doesn't overwhelm you. So having time away from screen and just just connecting your phone and just being out in nature, I think that's also very important. Um, so I think my key takeaway would be balance. Mm, okay. It was interesting. Uh, I can't remember what it was, Sarah, but we were at an industry function the other night and there was a, a lady from Russia talking about design codes in the built environment. And I oh, haven't yeah. been to Russia, but she was saying that down the street in say Moscow, the design code is so strong that KFC cannot have its own sign. It is literally a blue Russian blue a blue sign with Russian font that says KFC this way, for example, right? So she was telling me about how clean the environment was and peaceful, and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I like that. I feel like that's pretty that's pretty monochromatic, you know, and the diversity is not there. So um, she was talking about design about crimes. Design crimes, yeah. Well, that's right. It's finding the balance between design crime and font crime, and then. This example that we were talking about with this lady from Russia about the Russian <laughs> the design code that it seemed to have gone too far the other way. So yeah. I haven't really answered your question, but I agree with Sarah. I think balance is key. Mm. Um, Roman, I, I I'm not sure where that comes from. The 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 we're bombarded with visual, you know, like eighty percent or some crazy amount of our brain is dedicated to visual cortex. Mm. We are visual beings. Mm. like we're driven by you know uh, the, the 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 what we see around us first and foremost beyond almost all other you know touch is the next one um but yeah so we're already you know like i think humans are really you know we're kind of um, tailored towards that mm. i think it's it's rather than like challenging that it's like as sarah said is bring it on it's like turn it into an advantage um utilize it when you need it and don't when you don't right um so kind of become a master of, of, of how to manipulate that to your own benefit. Um, and, you know, even designers, we're very visual, kind of even more so than lots of other people. We're very visual dominated people. We work with, you know, vision, visual kind of stuff, where, whether it be font, colour, shape, form, style, whatever. Um, so, yeah, I reckon, like, uh, become a master of it rather than it mastering you um, mm -hmm. in a way way to look at it yeah yeah i think i like the more the better like there's so much cool stuff that you can <laughs> yeah. you can see like you yeah. know i mean yeah like turning the phone off is a really good idea but sometimes there's some really cool stuff on there and um you know like uh, some of the process porn videos are amazing and i love them oh, yeah. you know <laughs> And, uh, and you, you'll you'll take a little bit and you'll forget most of it and then you'll be looking at some cat video that's really crazy too. But um, yeah, there's a lot out there to, to cherry pick from and I think that's it. You just got to um, somehow, maybe our brains are good at sifting through and picking out the good stuff and forgetting the, the bad stuff. And sometimes it sticks and then you can use that on some seemingly unrelated thing down the track, you know? Mm -hmm. And hopefully AI will just step in and filter out all the crap. It will yeah. learn how what you like and it will just present you with it. But that's another issue Problem. as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so you're not, ex you're not exposed to anything that, you know, challenges you in mm, that case. Yeah. yeah.
we've seen in the last 10 years a real trend up in the number of instances where we're, we're producing and releasing and patenting on behalf of our clients, our clients are patenting projects that are coming up and often being, the patents are being submitted often within the same week as another design team in the other part of the world. And it's because we're all responding to the same trends on the same macro media and the same social media. And we're all, just, you know, designers are coming up with this. This probably a term for this, Rafa. I don't know what the design term is, but this convergence of ideas at the same time. And we're starting to have this mass conflict, right? It's kind of interesting. If you go back to when I started, you never hear about patent conflicts, but it's becoming quite a quite a thing now, you know? So, yeah, it's cool. interesting how exposed we are getting to similar content. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose as... as um. As young designers as well it's 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 kind of looking to the past for inspiration and not necessarily just doing a simple google search to find inspiration you know look to look to more sources pick up a book read a book and you know see what you can get out of because sometimes you know if you're all looking at the same google responses you're just going to get the same ideas and you're not necessarily going to think creatively in that way so that's also where innovation comes in. So instead of just reacting to what everyone else is doing, mm -hmm. um, you can do some design strategy and actually um, extend and defend and then do new to world and then new to us. So there's there's different ways that you can get around that. But mm -hmm. And that's probably, a, as a designer, you should challenge yourself to just not just um, do what everyone else is doing, try to do something new and innovative. Mm -hmm. And how can you make things better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming on today. It's been really nice to get everyone together in one spot to talk about design, the passion of everyone. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. That would be great. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Roman. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Good to see thanks you. for having us. Thank you so much. Good to see you guys. Have a great night. Have a good night. All right. See everyone. Bye-bye. See ya.